First of all, I don't like a cinema of ideas. If you proceed to write a screenplay based on an idea, I think it's going to be not a good movie. Uh, for me, it's always with the characters. It's a story about people. Deer Hunter is not about the Vietnam War, never was. It's not about politics. Heaven's Gate is not about politics. It's about what happens to people of all different sorts when they come in. You don't know a person until they're under pressure. It's like soccer, OK? The World Cup comes. There's intense pressure. The whole world is watching more than any other event, probably, in the world. And you see before your eyes some people making absolutely heroic efforts and some people falling down. And that's the test of a, of a man anyway, or a woman, is how do they handle pressure, real pressure? I mean, there's talk, there's intellectual talk. For me, movies are not intellectual. But there's a lot of intellectual talk about movies and what movies mean and all this kind of thing. And there's a lot of directors who love that, believe me, I know them. They love when the French start talking about, oh, yeah, in this movie you obviously meant this and that and blah, 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 blah. And they love it. They love the attention. They love the intellectual intention because in their mind it elevates them to what, I don't know, maybe they hope to become an angel or something. But I don't care about that. I mean, I think there's far too much attention paid to directors anyway. Uh, in the days of Hawks and, and uh, Ford and, and uh, Sturgis, you didn't even know what the hell they looked like. They were just names on the screen. And I think that's the way it should be. Somehow, over the years, it's evolved into a system where director is now celebrity. I hate it. I hate that you, it's not your face on the screen, it's the actors, it's the stars. They should be the ones being talked about, and they always were. I mean, directors were workers. Uh, Ford would get a call from... Uh, Columbia and say, okay, John, come to work on Monday. You got Betty Davis and Humphrey Bogart. And you would go to work. And in those days, they made a lot of wonderful movies, sometimes three movies a year. I mean, we make one movie every three years. It's horrible. It's like trying to play the World Cup, just the World Cup without playing the season. You're going to get your legs broken. But that's what they expect us to do today. It's silly. I, I would rather have been an employee of the studio, working for some crazy guy like Harry Cohn or Sam Goldwyn. But would you have been able to make a Deer Hunter or a, uh, Who knows what I've been able to make? Or Year of a Dragon in, in that kind of context? Who knows? Who cares? It, w it would have been something different but it might have been something absolutely fantastic. I mean, Goldwyn made Wuthering Heights. Everybody said, Sam, don't make the movie. He made the movie and it became a classic. Now, he's not some intellectual. Sam Goldwyn, none of those guys were intellectuals. But they were great storytellers, at least some of them, like Zanuck was a great storyteller. But they knew a story. They knew a story. Uh, and they knew people. I like that. I like those kind of guys. I always deal better with the top and the bottom. <laughs> the middle level bureaucracy I can't tolerate. That's why when I'm on location in distant countries, I get along great with gangsters, smugglers, kings, generals, all of which I've had to deal with, including New York City. Put me in the middle, I'm dead. I don't know how to talk to them. I don't know how to speak to them. I don't know how to deal with them. It's very, very hard for me. 
I'd rather deal with a dictator than a congressman. First of all, I believe, as Ford did, that Ford came from Maine, because, of course, I came from New York, most Easterners. And a lot of great Western artists came from the East. Um, for some reason, the people who came from the East, including photographers and painters, um, somehow felt more at home in the West. And that became their spiritual home. And you can't be further removed from Maine than Monument Valley. And that became his place. That became his West. And e even in the searches, when the, the famous first scene with the, the doorway, John Wayne, there's this title splashed across the screen saying, blah, 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 Texas, 18, whatever. Well, you're looking at Monument Valley, which is nothing like Texas. Texas looks, doesn't, doesn't look like that. It didn't matter. That was his West. And I think it's a director's obligation to find his own place. I would never go to, I went to visit Monument Valley to pay my respects and sign the book and make a contribution to the Navajo Nation. And all I wrote in the book was, God bless John Ford. Uh, every movie that people have made there since has been a failure, which I think is very interesting because when you find your place, you make a spiritual connection whether you believe in all that or not, but you have a spiritual connection with the place. And the place only yields its beauty to those people who respect it. It's like the saying that mountain climbers have, you don't respect the mountain, the mountain will kill you. Well, the same thing is very true in, in, in movies. I mean, you could have the most beautiful shot lined up and uh, and just at the moment you're ready to go, a beautiful backlight, a cloud blocks the sun. So the mountain is testing you. See, the mountain knows time is money and knows you're under pressure. You've got hundreds of people, thousands of people, and the, the clock is ticking and the mountain is testing you. The mountain is saying, hmm, how long can this guy hold out? Can I break him, or will he tough me out? If you have the guts and you wait, the sun will eventually come out. The mountain says, thank you for respecting me. And it gives you the shot. Good morning to you. You have a nice sleep out here? I can't write until, first of all, I have the name of the character, and I can't write until I can see the place. I have to see it in my mind, because I have no training in filmmaking, I have no training in writing, I have no training in any of this stuff. I was uh, studying fine arts and painting and architecture, and you know, I, I still don't know anything about movies, very little, but I know Without that connection, you can't make a real movie. You can never make a real movie unless you have that intimacy with the location. I remember you, we, we talked uh, at the time about how you used the magic hour a lot and you structured as much as possible, you structured the, the shoot, the daily shoot, uh, along those no. lines. Is that it's, it's, that's, that's not quite right. Uh, magic hour only lasts for a few minutes. So you can't possibly structure a day's work around that. But what you can do is, as I said before, if you, 
you have a street, Main Street. Uh, show me that picture that we set aside, the, the one of the town that we're going to scan. Okay, can you guys pick this up on the camera? Can you see it? Okay. That's not magic hour. That's first thing in the morning. This, this end of the street is south. North is up here. That means the sun goes around that way. And the reason you have all this, be look, look at the way the shadows are. You can see. Look at the shadows of the people. Now, the cameraman has nothing to do with that. You've lit it. You designed the sets with the art director. You decide to bring the train in. And you decide to have all the white smoke coming up. So you can't possibly do this at magic hour. Magic, there's thousands of people on the street, thousands of horses and wagons. You can't possibly. Maybe you can get one shot at Magic Hour. It's not Magic Hour. It's a, it's a but you do have a lot of both shots in the film when you have two characters, especially when you have Chris Christopherson and uh, Isabelle Huppert at uh, the end of the day when uh, Twilight, uh, you have a lot of those shots. There's one, I think, there's one shot like that. But see, you can't, if you're doing a scene this big with thousands and thousands of people and horses, you you can't wait. You've got to start shooting first thing. You arrive on the set, 8 o'clock, you're rolling. This took one whole day to rehearse and one whole day to shoot. Just this one shot, because it begins in the railway station. It's on a Titan crane. It begins in the railway station. The crane comes up outside. It goes higher and higher till you see this view of the street, so it starts inside the station, comes out a window, and goes up to the full extent of the crane, and you, and, and you get the shot. Just lining all that up, Magic Hour would be gone a go. hundred times. So you have to be careful of how you use that phrase. Now you see the light on this because of the axis of the street is just going to get better all day long because it's going to it's cross light in the morning in the afternoon it's going to be backlit i mean around noon it's going to be backlit and in the afternoon it's going to be side lit so it, it's you're determining the look right. there i was curious to know michael if you studied the old painters of the West, people like Albert Bichter, no. Thomas Cole, when you were preparing for, no, for this? I, that, that's, no, that's no so influence they, they whatsoever. Not an influence. No. Uh, no. I didn't do that for the same reason I don't use storyboards. I'm not looking to imitate uh, what somebody's already done two-dimensionally. A storyboard is a two-dimensional image. I don't know how people use them because they're so restrictive. It's like a color book for children where you fill in the colors. It's silly. Uh, no, I think you you go to the place and you have an idea and you know what you need. Uh, and hopefully you develop unique images which have nothing to do with paintings. And one of the reasons I moved away from painting and, and uh, is, is because they're two-dimensional flat pictures. And my idea was always to just break down the wall, to make the audience forget they're looking at something projected on a wall, tear the wall down, and pull the people eyes first right through the wall, and, uh, and move around things. So that's what I mean. I like to take the audience around, to move around. You like that? You like what you're looking at? Let me show you the reality of it. Boom, you come around to the side. Whole different experience.
choreography is a huge part of the mise en scène in your in your film, and uh, it has to be. Um, I mean, it, I mean, you, you mentioned uh, Max Opfels. I, I don't think there's an important uh, figure in in filmmaking that didn't like Max Opfels. I mean, uh, Kubrick was entranced by his work. I mean. Uh, the shots were so all-encompassing and so long that he had to know what somebody a hundred yards away was going to lift a teacup at us. I mean, people don't realize the amount of work that it takes to do something very simple. I mean, for example, the, uh, the Blue Danube I was just going to ask. Sequence. Yeah. There's several things. There's one outer ring of dancers moving clockwise. There's another moving counterclockwise. Then within those two rings, there are individual groups moving both counterclockwise and clockwise. And so the movement is incredibly dynamic and full of energy. Now, as I said, these are professional dancers. The best in it, we went all over England. And um, it took one month to rehearse that. How many dancers? Ooh, I don't remember, several hundred. Yeah. Um, and I asked my friend Vi, he used to say, hi, Clark, in the morning to Clark Gable. I said, Vi, when you were working with Busby Berkeley, how long did it take you to rehearse each sequence? She said, a month. There are certain realities. And you, you had to handle how many cameras? Four or five cameras? Uh, in that particular I don't remember. We, there's definitely more than one. But uh, too long ago to remember. But there's a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of cameras. And so many scenes are built around that visual motif of, of a circle. All the rituals are expressed in, in circles throughout the film. Well, a circle is, is life, it's a fact of life. But you were making your own life much more difficult on the set by uh, creating these uh, these choreographies, weren't you? Uh, I mean, right now we are two of us talking on a spaceship speeding around the sun, at a gazillion miles an hour, spaceship Earth, and uh, we're born, we die, we're reborn, we die again, we don't back. Circle is an inescapable fact. It's not something I made up for. And I remember you connected it to your interest in Indian culture. Well, yes, the Plains Indians used to say all things are round. That was their way of putting it. You know, there's a cycle of life. And we had a, we had a chance to learn a lot from them, but we ignored it, we threw it away. We exterminated them largely instead of learning from them. They knew. They knew what we hopelessly search for right now. They already knew that. I didn't make that up. All things are round. There's a title on the screen saying music composed by, but it really should say music adapted by, because I had originally engaged uh, John... Uh, Williams? John, John Williams. Williams. And John was set, and then he called me and said, Michael, I've just been offered a chance to do the, the Boston Pops. So it's a chance of a lifetime. I said, don't worry, go. So we had all of this wonderful Russian folk music, and we had uh, uh, we had a lot of Ukrainian music, and we had a lot of different uh, Eastern European people in the movie, the Germans, everybody. And the music was so rich that uh, Joanne put together this band 
they were not a band. They were just, she knew different musicians and she knows a great deal about music. I don't. She originally hired these guys to be part of the immigrants. And then when she discovered that each of them played an instrument, we made them into a band. She created that band. And when Chris heard them the first time, he said, you know, you should put that band on the road. They're that good. And they were, they were a great group of guys. So we took the indigenous music. Um, I mean, the Blue Danube is the Blue Danube, and the best version is the one by Bernstein. And the reason I think it was the best, because it was not, it was done at a, the real Blue Danube is done at a much slower tempo. Bernstein conducted it at twice the tempo, so that when we shot it, the dancers who were all trained dancers in England, professional dancers, they could not dance more than, the sequence was three minutes, the, the piece was three minutes. That's how Bernstein had it. I had to divide it into a minute and a half and a minute and a half. They could not make it to three minutes in the period wardrobe. They could only go for a minute and a half. So we had the Blue Daniel, that was, done. We had uh, the Harvard song that was there. And uh, we had the Mamo Two-Step, which was written by Doug Kershaw. So we had major pieces of music. And we said, let's use those things and let's adapt them. Let's adapt the music, and Joanne said, let's, let's do it. We'll, we'll just adapt it. We don't need a composer. So we didn't hire a composer. After John left, we said, to hell with it. You know, so many composers, sadly, you know, they got their favorite pieces, they put it in a drawer, they don't use it on one movie, they take it out and use it on another movie. I didn't want any of that. So uh, we just took the music we had, and we made it work. And I think it's, it's kind of an amazing result. And it gives it a unique, I, I think a unique textural component to the proceedings. You look like hell. I really live it up when you're away. Friend hates, so I'll come straight to it. It's getting dangerous here, and I want to know to leave. I want to you too. We haven't talked about the casting. Can you tell us a little bit about the process? Yes, the casting, the casting is, uh, casting was exhausting, as it always is. I mean, I knew who I wanted for the lead roles. And I've been very lucky in movies to get the people I've wanted. I mean, I wanted Clint Eastwood in my first movie. I wanted Jeff Bridges, and I got them. I was very, very lucky. And the second movie, I got De Niro and all the people, and I was very, very lucky. And Heaven's Gate, I was very, very lucky. I knew I wanted Christopherson and Bridges and Walken and, and uh, Isabel and, and all, the, all the main people. So that was... What really took a lot of work, and there I have to give all the credit to Joanne and Jane Halloran, who was the local New York casting director. Uh, they are the ones who found all of these other people. Uh, they worked to exhaustion every day uh, to get the musicians, to get all these different uh, nationalities, uh, uh, they're the real heroes. I mean, they're, they gave the movie that textural element of uh, multiplicity of cultures. I think they did a brilliant job. 
you know, most of those people are not actors, and a good many of them. And I've always worked a lot with non-actors. And the funny thing is about them, they come through. They come through. It's like when you play tennis, if you play, again, if you play somebody better than you, your game comes up. So you take a non-professional and you put him with a great actor, he becomes an actor. I was never disappointed in anything that they did. They worked so hard and it was so hot. Uh, you know, we went through several seasons. Uh, we began sometime in the very early spring. We went through the summer, back into the winter. It was, it, it was quite an experience. Were there moments, scenes where you let the actors improvise a little bit or not? Not really. I don't. Not in the way you understand improvisation, no. Or oh, let's put it differently, were there any parts that kind of grew as you were shooting that became a little more important than you had? No, uh, what's in the scene? script is what's on the screen. So you really stuck to, to the script. Yeah. That's your anchor. You know, making movies like being in a storm. You get tossed this way and that. And the one thing you have to hold on to is the script. The way you show the immigrant experience in this country is, is something we've never seen in other films. Um, oh, good. It's totally unique. And um, in what way? Well, you, you shatter the, the myth of the, the promised land in so what many ways. What did I shatter? I didn't shatter anything. Oh, yes, you do. Uh, what you, did I shatter? You, you present... What's the myth? Tell me what the myth is. Well, the myth that, that Europeans f fleeing their uh, Europe yeah. thought they would find. The, the promised land they thought they, they, thought yeah. they would find here uh, ended up being very different. And what I find fascinating is that so many of the rigid structures that they experience in Europe, the, the class structures, they find... Well, look, look, American people, to this very day, uh, like to say that America is a classless society. It is totally untrue. America was, is, and will always be, like every other society, a class, a system of classes. There was always an upper class, a middle class, a working class, a slave class. They're insisting on creating a myth. I didn't shatter any myth. They somehow want to believe people today. They want to believe we don't have classes in America. But look at the amount of attention that the world media is focused on in England right now, waiting the birth of this child, who's aristocratic. The same aristocrats who, in the early days of Harvard. The last scene in Heaven's Gate on the boat is shot off of a place called Bailey's Beach. Bailey's Beach was very famous in Newport, in the era when Newport was really booming. It was probably the wealthiest community in the U.S. at the time. That's where you find them. Now, Newport is still there. It's not what it was because once they instituted the taxes, income tax, kind of killed, killed Newport. But I promise you, There's a class system in America. There always was and there always will be. It's like Chris says in the movie, when JB says it's getting dangerous to be poor in this country, what does Avril say? Always was. It's, it's a statement of fact. It's not a judgment that I'm making. I'm not shattering a myth. I mean, maybe as a European, do you think of yourself as American or European? European. European. Maybe it's a myth held by Europeans. Mm -hmm. 
And so you think of it as shattering a myth. I just see it as the reality. People came out, struggled. I mean, eventually they succeeded in making farms and things like that, but they were very intense battles fought all over the U.S. But the American cinema has very rarely depicted that struggle. Because they, they don't want to believe it exists. They want to believe it. They, 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 they. For them, it doesn't exist, class system. And you actually opened the film on the future ruling class in, in Cambridge. Not the future ruling class, the, the ruling, ruling class. class. And I was wondering... I mean, what do you think uh, uh, Jefferson was? Jefferson, not an aristocrat? Washington was an extremely rich man. The Declaration and the, the, of Independence and the Constitution weren't written by garage mechanics or wheelwrights in Salem, Massachusetts. I mean, look at the writing. The writing itself tells you. These are extremely, Madison, all of them, they're extremely educated, well-read people. I mean, they wrote beautifully. We don't have a single statesman in Washington today who can write as well as any of them, as the least of them. I mean, the speech that Joe Cotton makes at the beginning, think about it. It's 1870, the class of 70. When did the Civil War end? It's five years prior. What? Five years prior. Okay. So this is a post-Civil War speech. And what he's saying in that speech essentially is, look, you're all privileged people. You are the elite. Use your learning and your influence and your wealth to go out and improve the country. Heal the wounds of war. Averill went out and he didn't succeed. And like many wealth, wealthy people to whom that happens, they retreat back to their wealth. That's all you see, that's the end. The end is that. It's simply going back to what you know a world that you're comfortable in again, that's all. There's no significance. There's no uh, symbolism intended. It's just simply that. I mean, I know people like that. And uh, you go back to, to your roots, so to speak. Well, your, your three main characters, uh, Jim, Ella, and Nate, seem somehow distanced, if not alienated from their own class. They really uh, stand with them, they kind of stand apart, and do you see those I don't three see it that way. No? You don't see those three characters as having left their class or having betrayed their class to some extent? Well, or, Averill obviously is trying to do what the Reverend Doctor, what Joe Cotton has advised him to do, but you know, not everybody went out and did that. People like Canton and Billy Irvine, they didn't go that way. You know, there's the herd and there's always the individual. So, it's like a football game. You talk to everybody, you pump them up for the game. Some people come through and some people fall down. You don't know who's gonna come through, you don't know who's gonna fall down. It's, it's just, it's just life. It's the way life is, there's no, I'm not making things up. There was one other thing I wanted to clarify a little bit because I've noticed that people kind of misinterpret uh, Irvine's speech, uh, John Hurt's speech at the beginning of the film and may not sense the irony. I mean, he he's presents a sort of defense of a status quo. And yeah, all he's saying is, we'll just keep everything the way it is, everything, the rivers will flow downhill and blah, 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 and we'll continue to boom. And... At Harvard at that time, during the commencements, they were pretty rowdy affairs. I mean, often the Boston police would have to be called in because it got so crazy. And his job 
as the class order is to provoke the speaker. And I don't know if you notice it, but across the whole back, across the doors, there's a whole line of Boston policemen in uniform. If you look closely, you'll see it. They were there in case things got out of hand, which they did. And so all he did was, Joe Cotton makes a speech about, hey, you're privileged, you're wealthy, you're educated, go out and help the country. John comes up and makes fun of him and tries to deflate him as much as possible and even to criticize his writing. But he really slams his writing. Like, like he was inept. His speech was inept. He said, but we will continue on our own way. And you know, all the rivers will still flow downhill. The North and South Pole will stay the same. But that was, that's historically correct. I mean, people don't know that unless you know about the history of Harvard. I didn't go to Harvard, I went to Yale. But they wouldn't let me shoot there either. People don't know that every graduation had a riot. And the Boston police always had to be called out. I mean, I could have done that. I could have staged a riot, you know, but what for? But you did something extraordinary in that scene. What's that? You have John Hurt says, say it's over. Yes. It's over. And he says it twice, maybe maybe three times. And it's like suddenly you, you know that these great ideals that have been spoken and, and so on are somehow going to be betrayed. There's going to be... No, it's not that as much as it is what he's, what he's really alluding to is that uh, it's possible to make that interpretation, I suppose, but what he's really alluding to is the... Uh, the best years of our life were over. It's over, James. You get it? It's, it's all downhill from here. That's more of what Billy's talking about. This is the best. We had the best of the, the Blue Danube. It's never going to be as good as... I had a, a beautiful note from Jack Nicholson after the first screening, and he said, Michael, Heaven's Gate is as good as it gets. And that's what John is saying. It's never going to be this good again. I mean, <clears throat> that waltz is almost delirious in its sense of joy and celebration. We're never going to match that again. That's what he's saying. That's what he's referring to. It's over. It's over, James. It's over. He has the, I mean, he is a half-assed poet. So he's making the case, I mean, he's not a stupid guy. He's making the case that, I mean, he's the only one in the association who stands up to say, hey, you guys can't, you shouldn't do this. They're not like the Indians, you can't kill them all. I was just going to say, that's the greatest line. He gets the greatest line. Because uh, he's smart. And that probably shocked some, some people, at least when the film opened, that... Uh, you have whites slaughtering whites. It would have been taken for granted if it was whites uh, slaughtering Indians, but the fact that it's whites against whites, I think, made it a very iconoclastic moment. People always need reasons, and sometimes there are no reasons. You know, we, we think we live in a rational world, a rational universe. We don't. We live in chaos. The universe is chaos. But in our own little pathetic lives, we assume that it's orderly and there are reasons that things happen and reasons that things don't happen. Right? We all do. It's a fiction of our... It's something we do to keep ourselves sane. But sometimes it doesn't work. I think the John... Uh, the urban character totally is on that wake blank. He totally understands that, I think. And he's probably one of the only, the only character that is totally yeah. in sync with that. Yeah. Like the buffoon in a, in a Shakespeare tragedy. Exactly. Not like the Indian. Can't just kill them all.
Now, how did Shakespeare come up with that idea? Who knows? It's not important. But he did it, and it works. Because the fool could tell the truth to the king, and that would be it's okay. accepted coming from his mouth, you know? Because from the he's fool. The fool. Because so he's, he's not to be taken seriously. So he can tell you the serious stuff. It's like Nixon was able to go into China for the same reason. He was always anti-communist, anti-this, anti-that. He's the first one to waltz into China. The same theory as the buffoon. We haven't really talked about your storytelling and... Uh how the, the script came about it. I mean, would you care to share some of the... the we the, have been the talking work? about storytelling. It's about people. No, but the, actually at the stage of writing, of uh, creating something out of nowhere. I don't I did, Listen, I, I, I didn't study writing. I don't know how it happens. Uh, I don't know why people write. I never learned how to write. I wrote out of a necessity. I wasn't going to get a chance to make a movie unless I had something that a major star wanted to do. In fact, Joanne said to me way back, she said, Michael, you want to direct a movie? There's going to be only one way. I said, what's that? Because I was very successful before I ever came out here in New York. And uh, she said, you're going to have to write a script. You're going to have to get the biggest star in Hollywood. And if he says yes, you'll get a chance to direct the movie. And that's exactly what I did. I wrote a script, I gave it to the biggest star at that time, it was Clint Eastwood. Number one box office, two years in a row. And boom, there it was. He said, I'll give you three days. He said, First of all, he said, so you think you can direct me, huh? I said, yeah. I'm looking up at him like this, he's seven foot tall. And uh, I said, yeah. So he laughed. He said, I'll tell you what, I'll make you a deal. No lawyers, no bullshit. He was like one of those old-fashioned guys. He said, uh, I'll give you three days. If I don't like what I see after three days, you go home, I take over, I own the script. I, I, I said, okay. The lawyer I had at the time went crazy. He said, are you nuts? So needless to say, I said, yes, I'm nuts, but I'm doing it, and uh, you're fired. And I went with Clint's lawyer. <laughs> it was a great experience, that experience. And uh, it was in many ways the best. It was just me and Clint, and that was that. And I would go to him every day, uh, so you happy with what you're seeing? He said, Michael, you just keep putting on the screen what you, you're putting on the screen. He said, he said, you know, I've done a million movies, and I've been in a million beautiful places all over the world. He said, and when I see the movie, I'm always shocked because it looked like it could be shot in the backyard. He said, you somehow, you have an eye for scope, and you put it on the screen. That's what I want you to keep doing. So he was telling me something that I was unaware of about myself. And uh, I think if you, if you have a character in your mind and the character is a true character, once they start talking, you just, you just follow them. You're not telling them what to do, they're telling you what, what to do, you follow them. I think we should talk a little bit about, you know, your original, your first original interest in that particular event, the uh, Johnson County War and... I've said, I, I can't say more than I've said, you know, it's just this incredible, um, event in the, um, the sordid pageant of American expansion. That's all. I don't have anything more to add than that. Uh, I'm curious to know how you found out about that event, because this is not something that is taught in school. Uh, so you did research, in other words, you did a lot of research. Well, I read. I read a lot. I read constantly. I'm always reading. 
Uh, I love reading history. I've always loved history. I was, unlike most Americans, Americans generally hate history and geography. I love both. I mean, Americans can't tell you where Wyoming is, much less where Iran is. They don't know. They have no idea, visual idea of the world. So um, you talk to people and you read, you learn. It's my favorite thing to do, reading. I mean, I've, I've read all of Nabokov a million times and all of his essays on literature, Russian literature, uh, world literature. And I've learned a great deal. But uh, I didn't learn how to write by reading Nabokov. It made me appreciate good writing all the more. And made me realize how feeble my own efforts are. You know, I mean, when you, when you read his analysis of Flaubert or Pushkin, uh, Evgeny Onyegin or Anna Karenin, you're ashamed to call yourself a writer. And I love reading the letters of uh, Flaubert to Colette uh, when he's writing uh, Bovary. And I love the letters to George Sand when he's writing Salambo, the next book that he wrote about the moon goddess of Carthage. They're wonderful. I love reading them. He said, oh my God, now I've got to do the county fair. The goddamn thing is going to kill me. <laughs> I mean, when you read that, you understand the, the, the labor of writing. It's never intellectual. It's never, oh, what is the theory? Um, what, 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 what's, I don't have an idea. He knows what he has to write. He says, how the hell am I going to do it? It's never intellectual. It's never an intellectual doubt. It's always a, dram a question of how do I dramatize it? How do I deal with so many people in the county, in the, in the fair? How do I show it all? How do I... Practical, simple questions. And this is coming from one of the great masters of literature. You've been interested in the human condition, I know, for quite a while. You tried to... Um, well, how could you human. not? How could anybody not be? It's so fucked up. It's the oldest story in the world. The old betray the young. The young die for the ideas of the old. The old spout the philosophy, the young pay the price. The oldest story in the world. How can you not be interested in that?